you stand with me this morning for the reading of our text? We're going to go to Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Genesis chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. You always got to be correcting the devil on something he already knows. He knew he was lying when he said what he said. He's setting her up with his questions. Don't let the devil talk. Don't let him talk. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Let me give you some revelation, Eve. Let me tell you some stuff that I know that you don't know. That's always his next step. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, ah, she listened or she wouldn't have looked. I said she listened or she wouldn't have looked. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. Oh, yes, wonderful thing. And a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her who was a dummy and he did eat. I paraphrased a bit. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I love you and thank you for everything you have done so far in this service. And I believe all of it, every single bit of it, has been to bring your message. So I pray right now that you will anoint these lips of clay, move me out of the way, speak your message only to your people and anoint every single one of us to hear and to receive that word in ground that has been turned up this morning already. We love you and thank you. Everybody said in Jesus' name, I want you to lift him up and praise him before you sit down. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. Figs are us. Figs are us. As if you don't get the joke, it's because you're too young to remember Toys R Us, I guess. I don't know. Toys R Us was like a magical place to me when I was growing up. We almost never went there. If we ever did go there, it was right before Christmas, so you knew what that was. It was to get a feel on what it might be that they might have that other places didn't have. And I loved it because it was like a magical visit. Amen. Let's pick up reading verse 8. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. First thing you're going to do when you disobey God in sin is hide from him, which is impossible to do, makes absolutely no sense. They knew him, and yet here they are. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? <laughs> he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. People will tell you stuff if you just let them. He said, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree? Whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? The man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. She forced it down my throat. She tied me up, cut it. No, that's not what happened. He's blaming it all on her when he by choice ate it. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? The woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. He fooled me. He tricked me. And that's why I ate the fruit. She says nothing about her choice. The Lord God said unto the serpent, You don't even ask him a question. 
The devil gets punishment straight. There's no fooling around with him. He says, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, a war, a war. And thou shalt bruise, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said, because punishment still coming. Justice still has to be done. Judgment still has to be passed. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat. Notice he did not phrase that to Eve. Because he didn't tell Eve, he told Adam. So he tells, he's telling Adam, I told you no. And you did it anyway. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow thou shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And things that are still in motion today were set in motion there. But before they did it, it wasn't. This was not the plan. This is sin interfering with the plan. This is sin getting in the way. And we got two ways to go. I've heard both of them. Oh my goodness, we shouldn't get on Adam and Eve so much because we would have done the same thing. And the other version of that is, I don't know how Adam and Eve are so dumb, I would never do that. Most of that is spoken on the inside. We don't really believe that if we were at Adam and Eve's place that we would do the same thing. We just say it. Jeremiah chapter 24. Beginning with verse 1. Three trees mentioned there in the garden, only one of them by name. Sure, one of them's called the tree of life, one of them's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the fruit they ate thereof, one an apple, we don't know what it was. But the third one is mentioned in its current name. They sewed aprons up to cover their nakedness with fig leaves. The one tree mentioned by name. Jeremiah 24, beginning with verse 1. The Lord showed me, and behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord. After that, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah with the carpenters and smiths from Jerusalem, and had brought them to Babylon. One basket had very good figs, even likened to the figs that are first ripe. The other basket had very naughty figs. Bad figs. Which could not be eaten. They were so bad. Then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs. The good figs, very good. And the evil, very evil. They cannot be eaten. They are so evil. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good, for their good, for their good. For I will set mine eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up, and I will give them a heart to know me. That I am the Lord. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. For they shall return unto me with their whole heart. With what part of their heart? With all of it. And as the evil figs which cannot be eaten, they are so evil. Surely thus saith the Lord, so I will give Zedekiah the king of Judah and his princes and the residue of Jerusalem that remain in this land and them that dwell in the land of Egypt. 
And I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt, for their hurt, for their hurt. To be a reproach and a proverb, a taunt and a curse in all places whither I shall drive them. And I will send the sword, the famine, the pestilence among them till they be consumed from off the land that I gave unto them and to their fathers. You got two choices, and that's the only two choices that you have. Your good figs or your evil figs. There's no medium fig. There's no okay fig. It's all the way one way, wholehearted, or it's all the way the other way, other way with whatever part of your heart it is that you're serving him. I want you to notice that the conversation starts off with the figs already good and already evil. They made a choice before the judgment came. You cannot look at God. You're never going to be able to look at God and say, this is not fair. When if, if, and I hope not a single person within the sound of my voice or even not in the sound of my voice, nobody goes to hell. But if you do, you're not going to be able in judgment to stand before him and express to him the unfairness of your life that put you there. All the things you know, he knows. And all the things you don't know, he knows. And in that moment, you're not even going to be able to verbalize it. You're just going to know it's over. And if you do become a good fig, then when you stand before the Lord, you're not going to be able to talk to him about, oh, how great it was. Because you will know what he knows. And that is that you were never worthy in the first place. And that the only reason you're there is because you made a choice to serve him. A choice he allowed us to make. One philosophy, theology, I hesitate to call it it, but it is one. That I can never understand. And look, I'm going to be, I think that as a man of God, you should try to understand. You should try to understand when something, somebody says something and, well, it's in the word. You should go find out if it's in the word or not and what it means. But the philosophy is really more what it is. But okay, the theology of predestination blows my mind. I don't mean the predestination of the church. That is biblical. The church is going to heaven. The good figs are going. But I choose whether I'm a good fig or not. The idea that he's already made the decision is anathema to me. It disgusts me. It bothers me because the whole of the word does not say this. There's literally no point in all of it if that is the case. It makes May I be so bold? The salvation, the sacrifice of Calvary to none effect. And if that's the case, I'm against it. I'm not for it. No, you make a decision. And honestly, we make it more than once. You make a decision whether you're going to serve God or not numerous times. Maybe not every decision is a salvation decision. I'm not telling you that. I'm not saying that. But there are salvation decisions you will make. You will say, this day, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm not going to follow the, the, the gods either from the land we came out of or the land we're going to. I'm going to follow him. I get nervous. <laughs> I love it. I love it when public figures turn over to Jesus. I love it. I love it when they start talking about Christianity in a positive light. I love it, especially when they get to the point where it seems they've developed a personal relationship with Jesus. I love it. I think the more light, the better. But it always makes me nervous. Why? Because they are human beings. And enough people are watching them, or the same people are going to watch them fall. I'm going to clue you in this morning. Bro, the star's going to fall. You think that ain't possible? I know you don't. Oh, brother star. Brother star's a human. Like everybody else in this building, you have flesh. 
and you have to deal with that flesh. And if you're pretending you don't have that flesh, you're not dealing with it. If you're saying, I'm holy, holy, it's Pharisees. We saw what happened with them. It's not good. I don't want to be a Pharisee. There's certain things that I don't want, to, don't want to have as a part of my life. A pharisaical spirit is one of them. I don't want to have a pharisaical spirit. I don't want a spirit of Jezebel. I didn't plan this. I wrote notes. That's, I thought that was something different, but I guess it's not. I don't want a spirit of Jezebel. I don't want the spirit of Delilah. I don't want the spirit of Absalom. No. No. I don't want the spirit of Kor. All of these spirits have something in common. Do you know what it is? Anybody? They're dumb. <laughs> well, there's one thing. They're all sinners. No, it's deeper than that. What do all of them have in common? Every single one of them, from the position that they believed that they had, were rebellious against the authority in their life. Every single one of them. They expressed it in different sins, but it was the same spirit. And we really don't have very many people. Now, I called my cat. One of my cats, I called her Delilah, but I called her that for a reason. That girl had two litters before I could get her fixed. And she's very, very pretty. So I'm like, all right. She's a handful. But I didn't name my kid Delilah. I don't know of anybody that's named your kid Delilah. I know there's one, there's one on the air. It's popular. It's a terrible thing to do. Certain names should not be repeated. Huh? When we were going through our list of names, our baby name list, we didn't have Core down there. We didn't have Absalom down there. Which, you know, who's going to call her kid Absalom? You know, American probably not going to do that. I ain't call him Judas. I'll tell you that. If I called my son Judas, he'd never be able to live it down. He's got to fight it his whole life. Jezebel? Not hardly. Right? Why? Because the sin that they committed was so atrocious and upfront that we don't want to be remembered of it anymore. We don't want to talk about it anymore. We certainly don't want to name our heritage after it. And that's what those spirits do as well. You don't want to name your heritage after a rebellious spirit. The worst thing that a rebellious spirit does, listen to your pastor, is rub off on the children. It does a lot of bad things. That's the worst thing. It continues like a disease with the kids. And they may get a toned down version of it, but they'll still have it and there'll be more of them. Which is exactly what the devil wants. Judges chapter 9. Beginning with verse 7. You have to understand here before we read this, the situation's uh, ongoing and some guys have risen up and they've just slaughtered a bunch of their own. Hebrews killing Hebrews. And all of it is for power. All of it is to gain control. And then here comes this little prophet. Verse 7. When they told it to Jotham, he went and stood in the top of Mount Gerizim, lift up his voice and cried and said unto them, Hearken unto me, you men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness? Wherewith by me they honor God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? And the trees said to the fig tree, Come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said, unto them. Should I forsake my sweetness and, and my good fruit and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said the trees unto the vine, Come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? All three of these trees, the three most important trees in Israel, 
all refused to be promoted over the trees in this parable. Then said all the trees unto the bramble, Come thou and reign over us. And the bramble said unto the trees, If in truth you anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now therefore, if you had done truly and sincerely, and that you had made Abimelech king, and if you had dealt well with uh, Jeroboam and his house, and had done unto him according to deserving of his hands, for my father fought for you, and adventured his life far, and delivered you out of the hand of Midian, and you are risen up against my father's house this day, and have slain his sons, three score and ten persons, upon one stone. And have made Abimelech the son of his, man, of his maiden servant, king over the men of Shechem, because he is your brother. If you then have dealt truly and sincerely with Jeroboam and with his house this day, then rejoice you in Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come out from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and the house of Milo, and let fire come down from the men of Shechem and from the house of Milo and devour Abimelech. He said, here's a story for you. The trees want a king. The olive tree, the fig tree, and the, and the vine refuse, refuse the promotion. Sometimes it's God's will for you to refuse the promotion. Sometimes it is God's will for you to refuse the promotion. It's not always his will for you to get more money. It's not always God's will for you to be blessed in a way you think is what blessing is financially. Huh? Fame. Right? Promotion. But these trees are so desperate, they don't stop. And that's always the way it is. We got a bramble ruling right now. Do you hear me? The President of the United States is a bramble. Here, I said it. I can say it. Many a prophet stood before a king and told him he was wrong. We don't stop now. All right. Even though he's not a king. The fact of the matter is, the tree said, but it's more important, listen to me, it's more important to get somebody over us than it is to get it right. Nobody goes to the bramble to be the king. What are you talking about? Thorns, have you ever got tangled up in them? I'm not talking about you a little scratch. Have you ever tried to go through the woods where there's a whole lot of them? Huh? You come out different, don't you? you don't, you're not the same as, as the way when you went in. All kinds of tore up. How about them little things attached to your socks? Yeah, yeah that's plenty fun. Go for a walk in the woods, supposed to be relaxing. Last thing in the world it is when they get a hold of you. This bramble... Do you know what happened? He was describing them picking a blimelech as picking a bramble to be king and said, hey, if it's right, if what you did was right, then it'll work out right. But if not, fire's coming. Guess what happened? Anybody want to take a guess what happened? The men of Shechem turned against Abimelech and fortified their city. Abimelech finds out about it and comes and wipes the whole city out, kills everybody. And he keeps going. And he attacks a tower, and he's fighting another city, and a woman drops a millstone on his head. And Abimelech's dying, and he looks at his young uh, helper, and he says, he says, run me through with a sword. Because I don't want the people to, to know that I die by the hand of a woman. And his obedient servant stabbed him with a sword and killed him. Listen, it is not okay. To ignore the word of God. It's a bad idea. When I start to say, yeah, but. Hey, Pastor, that's a good word. Except. Listen, your flesh believes that it is the exception to every rule. Yours does. That means everybody's. You, be, you believe that you will never do the thing other people will do. 
It's a terrible idea. It's a terrible thought process to get it there, but for the grace of God go I, as in Scripture, but it's good. It's good. <laughs> this will keep me from judging people when I see them in predicaments that they're in. This thing floating around, people love to put it up, and I'm not going to knock it. Pretty sure some of y'all put it up. I'm really not going to knock it because I don't want you to think that I, I don't even know. Trust me, I don't remember nothing about it. Who put, some, who put it up and who didn't. But it's all over the place. And it's been for a while. It kind of gets rehashed every once in a while. And, uh, and, and the, the, it's like a little, um, it's a little meme, right? And it says something along the lines of, uh, don't judge that person because you only see this much of their life and you don't see the whole thing. It's not unwise. It's true. Whenever I run into somebody, I'm not seeing all of them in that moment that I'm with them. This is why people can get surprised. Somebody gets arrested, and what happens? The whole family. I don't care. I don't believe it. Right? Especially mama. He was a good boy. He was not a good boy. He was quite obviously not a good boy, mama. But we, we, we forgive mamas on that. We need them to love us unconditionally. All of us do. But it's funny when everybody else is, and they were, I grew up with him, and I, I didn't know he was a bad guy. He would never, some of them, he would never do this or do that. Man, we give a lot of influence and power to what we visually can see. We see it, oh, but let somebody wear a hairdo we don't like. Let somebody dress in a way that's different from us. Let somebody talk. Oh, my goodness. I, we all got stuff. I sit down to eat with people and they smack their lips. I want to go to heaven immediately. The fact of the matter is that all, I might say all, all have sinned and come short. Ha-ha. I saved 800 people's souls. I went out and read. And re you didn't save anybody's soul. Not a one person's soul. Did you say you witnessed 800 people and you brought them to the Savior? That's what you did. And that's an excellent choice. But it does not remove all the other choices that you still got to make. You still got to get to a place where the altar is in your life. You cannot remove the altar from your life. You cannot remove forgiveness from your life. You cannot remove repentance from your life. When the blood stops flowing, your protection stops coming. You can be filled with His Spirit, yes, and should be filled with His Spirit, all of us. But are you listening to it? Is it influential in your decision making? I'll give you an example. You get the idea of going on a job, and it looks fantastic, and you, you pray about it, and you Talk to me about it, maybe. And you go to the interview and everything works out and you and you and and they're gonna offer it to you, and it's just a wonderful, it's just an example, just a wonderful thing all the way around. Did you seek God's will for that? I mean, did you ask God, is this what you want? And did you do it before you did anything else, including talking to me? Did you take it before the throne? Because if you didn't take it before the throne, it's probably because you think you're not going to get what you want. Whenever I find myself in hesitation in the presence of God, it's because I've got something going on that's interfering with his will, and I really don't want to talk about it. I got sin in the camp, or maybe it's not even sin yet. Disobedience, we'll get there. But rather, it's just this thing I want to have. Am I the only one? I've had the Lord deal with me. He has to come. I am, in a way, wasting the time of the Almighty. That can't be good. The first time He came to me should have been enough. It should have been enough. When He met you on the rooftop, Nicodemus, you should have been a follower of His the next day. You should have been with him. You should have been walking. You should have 
you should have ignored the Sanhedrin and that been it. But you had so much going for you there and all of it will look good so you stay. Even when he says, you must be born again of the water and of the spirit or you can't get in the kingdom of God, Pharisee. No matter how good a life you've lived. We hear this all the time, don't we? They lived a good life. I think that's exceptional. I think it's, a, it's something every Christian should be able to say about every believer. If you call yourself a Christian, a good life should be a part of what comes out, right? But if you are not saved, the good life doesn't mean very much. Luke chapter 13. Verse 1, there were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Two major things had taken place right before this event where Jesus is speaking to, to the crowd. The first one was that this tower had fallen over and a whole bunch of people had been killed in it. And the other was this. These Galileans were offering their sacrifices, and Pilate had them mercilessly executed on their sacrifices while they were doing it. This is, by the way, one of the worst things you can do to a Jew. This is war stuff. This is fighting stuff. This is pick a sword up. We don't let the, the temple be defamed stuff, okay? That's what had just happened. Jesus answered and said unto them, Suppose you, these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. What the Jews were doing to pacify a war, to keep stuff from getting violent, they were putting the blame on the Galileans and putting the blame on the people in the tower. They were saying the reason that they died this way must be because they're bad people. Do you hear me? And this is Jesus talking. This ain't no bumpkin from the side of nowhere. This is the king of glory. Listen. I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And just in case you can get the point across. Or those 18 upon whom the tower and Siloam fell and slew them, think you that they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you no. But except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And he spoke a parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then he said unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree. And I find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? Why is it taking this space in the ground? It can be used for something else in the vineyard. And he, that is the husbandman, the one given charge over the vineyard, answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. He says, wait a minute, master. Give me another year. And what does he say he's going to do with it? Huh? I'm going to dig around it, and I'm going to fill it with poop. He's going to dig it and dung it. That's what, that's what he's going to do. Dig it and dung it. We want it to grow. I want it to grow. Lord Jesus, I want to grow. And God says, cool, I'm going to dig it, the thing you think is strongest. And I'm going to put manure in there so you grow. I don't want to grow now. Is there any way I can stay in a teeny tiny? No, it's not my will. It's not God's will for you to remain a tiny sapling. It is your, his will for you to grow. I don't care if you're 70 years old or seven. He's never, ever, God has never, ever looked at somebody and said, it's fine, baby doll. Go ahead and remain unfruitful. Never. 
Not, you can't find an instance. His desires, his will is for us to grow. Now, fig. Does anybody like figs besides me? You, do you know that what we eat ain't really the best? Figs do not travel well. So they dry them out. They do a bunch of stuff to keep them. So the stuff you're eating, the stuff that I've ever always eaten, unless you guys are getting fresh ones, I, I don't know where you're getting them from. But I've heard that they're way better. Or it's juicy and I got people nodding your head so you know, you know about it. I do not. I know Fig Newtons. That's what I know. <laughs> it's best to be transparent when you preach. And I love a Fig Newton. Anyway. But they are rich in taste. They have aromatic leaves. The leaves smell good. And they're nice size leaves too. They cause eventually, eventually. I say eventually. Eventually, they cause great shade. It takes a fig tree a long time to grow. But it can get 30 feet in the proper conditions and provide a very good place. This is why you can look it up later. In the scripture over and over again, it refers to laying under the fig tree, right, as a sign of wealth or at least independence. John chapter 1, verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. How would you like for Jesus to say that about you? Really? Anybody? Oh, my goodness. You're like, I really would like for him to say it if I knew what guile meant. <laughs> kind, of thought that was, kind of thought that was coming. Here comes a Jew with no deception in him. He is honest. The maker is looking at him and saying this about him. He's an actual good man. Do you understand? He's a good man. He doesn't accept promotion on the necks of other people. You know, I really like to have that position. I think that position would be something that I could really knock out. I could really kill it. I could really, I could certainly do better than the guy that's got it right now. In fact, I can find a way. I know I can. He's a terrible guy. I can find a way to subvert his position. And now you're not doing God's will. Just like that, I have had people who should know better. I've seen them do it. I've had them do it to me. <laughs> Tempt to. And you go, oh, I'm going to, No. Listen to me, and I hope you get what I'm saying. The position's not important enough to surrender your integrity over it. Because your integrity is integral to your witness. People are not going to listen to you if they don't think they can believe you. They're not going to believe you if they can't believe in you. You understand? And you are human like I am. So you got to keep taking this thing to Calvary all the time in order to stay with integrity. Anything less, you're, you're going to run into trouble. Next verse. But Daniel said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? I don't know you, man. How do you know me? Notice he did deny that he was full of honesty. He didn't deny it. <coughs> That's what honest people do, right? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Jesus says, let me just make it clear who it is you're talking to here. Next verse. Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the son of God. Thou art the king of Israel. I, 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 I love these about faces. I love it when you go from, what are you talking about, to you're the king of glory. What's the likeness? Mm. Nathaniel says, oh, he saw me when I was under the fig tree. Nathaniel was a man of independence, at least. Maybe had wealth. He certainly was okay. Because he had his fig tree he could lay under where Jesus saw him. But you can't stay in that place of comfort and do the will of God. You had to answer. You had to come see what is he about. And then when you know who he is, 
you got to get on board. Brother Starr, it's the opposite for me. I don't know if God can use me. I've been all kinds of messed up. I've done all kinds of stuff that ain't worthy. I got stuff I've done that I don't ever want to talk to you about ever. Because the minute that I reveal that sin to you, you're going to think differently of me. And you're not ever even going, you're not even going to look at me anymore. I hope that isn't true. I am human. I'm going to have to take it to God. Hopefully I never make it obvious to you that I'm bothered by anything. Because here's what happens to me, and I'm hoping everybody. Somebody starts talking about how bad it happened to me yesterday. Somebody started talking about how bad somebody was and the terrible things that they had done. I open my mouth to go, oh, no, that's terrible, and begin to remember the terrible things that I have done. That should happen to you. It should stop the judgment. Hear me. My judging of other people, and I'm not talking about biblically because that's correct, but unbiblically, judging them is stopped by the judgment of God that I know he did not pour out on me in what I have done wrong. When I get grace, I should be able to give grace. Grace is a gift. It keeps on giving. I should be thinking about myself. Oh, no, I'm a terrible person. I'm not doing that. No. Lord, you're worthy. I believe. And this is biblical. I believe that every single one of you is destined, purposed by God to achieve great things in the kingdom. Things that I necessarily cannot do. I need you. We need you. Everybody needs you. Take that sin to Calvary and let it die there. Get up and be a new man. Be a new woman. If everything in your past is in your present, then you have no future. Everything from your past should not be affecting you now. There might be a thing or two you're fighting through, and I hope you fight because you need to win. Maybe there's some stuff like Bishop preaches where you go back to it and get honey from the lion. That's a positive result. Do you hear me? If something in my life drives me to Jesus, it's positive. If that thing in my life tries to keep me from him, it's negative. Those are the things that have to go. Turn it over to Jesus. And then that Way too long held, and you'll smile. When is it over? The rest of the day. You sing that all the time, but it's true. Matthew chapter 21. You knew I was going to go there. You knew at some point we were going to read this verse, these verses. Matthew 21, verse 18. Be good if I was in the right chapter. 21, 18. Now in the morning, now I want you to understand there's more than one version of this story. but I'm reading this one for a reason because it's just a tiny bit clearer, which Matthew often is when it comes to details. And in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. That's Jesus. He saw the fig tree in the way he came to it and found nothing thereon, but leaves only. He said unto it, let no fruit grow on this henceforth forever. And here's the part that isn't included in the other versions. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, how soon is the fig tree withered away? When Jesus cursed the fig tree, it immediately died. 
right there, withered right up and died. When the master has no more use for it, the tree's got to go. When his disciples, oh, anyway, uh, verse, uh, let's see if I get this right, 21. Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, if you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things, whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. And this is the lesson he's teaching by immediately killing the fig tree. Why do it? Later on it says it wasn't even season to teach a lesson. And the lesson is this. You can look at a mountain and tell it to be removed. That's impossible. I said, that's impossible. That'll never happen. You look at a mountain and say, be removed and cast into the sea. And it must be done. And then all things. Everybody say all things. All, that doesn't mean some things, does it? All things. Whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. Ask in prayer, believing, you just run your mouth. That's not the same thing. You ask in prayer and you're believing. I'd like the musicians to come. There's three types of plants used in Scripture, as I've already mentioned. Three types of, of trees, basically. Well, one's not really a tree, but that's why I said plants. One is the olive, one is the fig, and one is the vine. And all three of these have type. They are symbols. Now, all of them have to do with a relationship between God and you. But each one of them focuses on one aspect more than the others of that relationship. The olive focuses on where you and God meet. Focuses on that connection and everything that has to do with it. The vine focuses on the spirit of God, the one who is coming. There's no, there's no branch without the vine. And the fig deals with our flesh, us, in coming into that relationship with him. From Genesis, where they sewed the apron on from fig leaves, all the way to Revelation talks about figs. It's a type of our flesh. Figs are us. It's a type of us. Now, wouldn't you think if that's the case, you should really know? If you want to know what God's will is, it's imperative to know how he's moving through you. What about me? Maybe we think we know everything. Let's see if we know it all. It takes three to five years for it to bear fruit. Sister so-and-so has been in church for six months and don't understand why she still looks like she does. Are you the fig maker? Uh, uh, it takes time to develop in the kingdom. I was talking with somebody the other day. I said, don't worry about it. I keep repeating this mistake. All of us have done that. Stay the course. Don't quit. And you'll be victorious because the Lord will win that battle for you. And I said, I do, I do know some. You can't, you can't nail it down. I know some that start to serve God. And normally, honestly, the ones I can recall, they fought him real hard first. When they come to him, they shoot right through the roof. Wah! They, God's calling them to preach or call them to do this or that. And he just take off. But it's not all the time. It's not most of the time. <clears throat> it's almost, it's almost regular enough that we can, we can kind of see it. If a child of God makes it two years, they usually make it. takes three to five years for a fig tree to grow to bear let me be clear to bear fruit you got to put in you got to put in you got to put in before they give out before the return starts to come 
You parents got these little kids born and raised in church like I was, and you're putting in them, and you're putting in them, and, and everything you're putting in them is what's going to come out. But it doesn't happen overnight. A fig tree needs a lot. I don't mean a little. It needs a lot of sun. It will not grow. It will not do anything if it's shaded. It has to have a lot of sun. Child of God, you're not going to be able to serve him if he's not shining down on you all of the time. You need a lot of sun. I need a lot of sun. It can grow large in time. And it has no flowers on the outside. Did you hear me? Fig trees have no flowers, no pretty stuff on the outside. You know when you bite into that fig and those crunchy seeds crunch? Those are inside of the fruit flowers. I just hope that I can look good. You look good, boy. I'll tell you what. I hope I can, I hope I can look good. Don't worry about that. What's going on on the inside? Do you have flowers on the inside? You know, the most shut that out of a hussar. You see, that's the seed. It's the flowers of the fig inside the fruit is what turns into the seed. It's actually what you eat. It's actually the beneficial part. Did you know that? Did you know that figs are almost all carbohydrates? Did you know that? Meaning, and it's found in scripture. There's a place in scripture where a prophet was given figs to eat, and he got strength to go. That, that's what it'll do. This fruit that we bear. serve God, to come to Him, to be what they didn't even know they could be. Stop looking for flowers on the outside. The flowers are on the inside. The beauty is on the inside, not on the outside. I'm not telling you you can't look pretty, dress right. I mean, give me a break. You know I'm not telling you that, right? I'm telling you the importance of it is minimal. It's what's inside. What's happening on the inside of you? The last point I want to make this morning is that in order for a fig tree to be pollinated, every one of these fruit has a little hole in it. And the hole has nothing to do with fig trees. You already knew. In order to be pollinated, it has to have that little hole so a wasp that is specialized for figs can go up in the hole and, and pollinate the tree. I don't want to be stung. I don't want to be hurt. I don't want to have a problem. A wasp, nobody wants a wasp, but you got to have it or you're not going to grow. If you reject the hand of God that brings pressure in your life, the hand that allows Job for the adversary to do stuff to you, if you reject it, you'll not be Job. You'll never get to the end of the book. The wasp has to be there for the fig tree to bear fruit. Would you stand with me this morning? The Holy Ghost is speaking, and I hope I'm making it clear enough. This altar is open, and it's open for those who want to bear fruit. Those who are willing to say, not my will, but yours be done. Oh, that's what the great example said. Not my will, but yours be done. Are you hungry enough this morning? Do you want to bear fruit? This altar is open. Let's sing.
you take a minute right oh, now and sing yes, his face? Take that word and put it in your heart. Verse 32, Jesus is speaking again. He says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. It's where we are. There is no doubt of where we are. He's at the door. Now's the time to bear fruit or you're never going to. Now's the time to reach out. Now's the time to be what God's called you to be. There is no other time but now. Lord Jesus, I love you and I thank you for all that you have done. I pray for your hand to rest mightily upon your people and for your word, O oh Lord, to go forth with them. Almighty God, help us to bear fruit. Help us to bear it in time. Help us, O oh Lord, to do your will, to be what you have called us to be, created us, made us to be. We thank you, O oh Lord, for your mercy and your grace. Use us, we pray. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Let's lift him up and thank him one more time this morning.